All right. Good day, everyone, and welcome to episode 23 of In Conversation with Convergence. I am George Evans, one of the founders of Convergence, and we have a terrific guest today, Fizza Khan. And Fizza, for those who might not know her, many do, uh, is the founder and, and CEO of Silver Regulatory Associates. And, and she's going to do a much better job than I can do talking about silver regulatory. But, you know, think of silver as, uh, you know, a third party uh, compliance firm providing outsourced compliance services to investment advisors. And, uh, you know, we found Fizz to really be an expert on, you know, regulations, right, that are governing uh, investment advisors. So welcome, Fizz. It's, it's great to have you here today. George, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, we are thrilled that you're with us. So let's get, let's get our audience to get to know you a little bit. And sure. uh, I'd love you to first talk about uh, yourself a little bit and your background and your pedigree. And then uh, clearly we want to hear all about the uh, silver regulatory. Sure thing. So I am an attorney by background. I have my experience centered around investment management so I did my time at a law firm, Kramer Levin, in their financial services group. And from there, I held various in-house roles and positions, which I think centered me and allowed me to get to where I am today with Silver. Prior to Silver, I was part of the Council Works team that that organization really was a leader in starting the whole concept of compliance consulting. In 2016, we became a part of Duff and Phelps, which I believe is now Kroll, and their regulatory consulting group. And I was encouraged by friends, colleagues, clients even, to get back to a more boutique business model. And I never in a million years, George, thought I would become an entrepreneur, but the encouragement was one where I thought to myself, why not? You know, what's what's the most that I have to lose? Right. So in 2018, I founded Silver. And from there, it's just been a wonderful ride. I, I'm thoroughly enjoying myself being in the position I'm in with, you know, developing and growing Silver. I have an excellent team of compliance professionals that are leading the way as well. And quite frankly, it's just such a great time to be in the space because so much is happening. Well, you know, it's funny you say that because, you know, here, so you're entering year five, right? Yes. And uh, actually Convergence in April will be 10 years old, right? So we- Congratulations. Yeah, so we, you know, we went that entrepreneur route also, right? And for something we saw a big gap for, you know, in, and and actually, I'm sure you'll get into this, but we we were very big on the legacy providers to us weren't getting any, weren't getting it done right. So, right. so that's one of the real reasons we built and launched uh, Convergence. Um, you know, as you so now as you enter year five, yes. let's tell our audience a bit about uh, silver regulatory kind of you know because you you talk about it being a great time. I I couldn't. Uh, agree with you more. There is more interest in outsourced compliance than I've ever seen. Yes. Uh, there's more, more out. There are more third-party compliance firms probably yes. than I've ever seen. Right yes. in the last uh, year or two, and then you see some of the service providers in the industry. Uh, you know, particularly um, uh, administrators who are looking to maybe even pick up these kinds of firms and kind of bolt them on and bring them, you know, a broader set of services to, to an investment advisor. So before we kind of get into that, I'd love, love for you to tell us a bit about silver and your, your size, your focus and, um, and, uh, you know, get our, get our audience familiar with your firm. Sure. So, and, and thank you for allowing me to have this opportunity. I think, First and foremost, you know, the foundation of the firm is really predicated on regulatory advice and services to the investment management community at large. Silver tends to focus primarily on private fund advisors. Um, we uh, help various types of strategies, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, 
uh, as of late, we're getting, you know, not surprisingly, a lot of crypto and digital mm-hmm. asset managers coming our way. And that's been a very interesting uh, group of clients to manage. But overall, what our focus really is on is helping guide these types of managers in the way that they need to understand their regulatory obligations, whether it's with the SEC, the CFTC, FINRA, NFA, we have a team that has the expertise to appropriately provide the advice that fits a particular business model uh, strategy. It's not a one size fits all. And that's really our hallmark calling card is that we are very focused on ensuring that we are providing the advice to our clients that is specific and suitable for them. Yeah. What, well, what is your footprint, uh, Pizza? Tell us a, a little bit about kind of the, the market, you know, kind of geographically that you cover. Geographically, we are focused on the United States, are, and I'll clarify that. So we do have managers that are situated globally. The advice that we give to these managers is based on U.S. advice. I'm sorry, U.S. specific regulations. Right. We defer to our law firm colleagues, other compliance consultants that are based outside of the United States that provide advice as it relates to non-U.S. jurisdictions. But we are specifically focused on the U.S. Our managers are globally based. However, most of them are situated in the United States in and but we service all managers. Yeah. And, you know, as you know, right, there's give or take, right? There's about 20,000 advisors registered with the SEC in close to 70 countries. Right. right. There's another 20,000 registered with the 50 states. Uh, yeah. And then there's another 10,000 in Europe and Asia that I would just kind of say are non SEC registered, right? So we think there's about 50,000 ish, right, investment advisors. You know, so as you look at the market, right, and um, the, the, you know, obviously um, last year's FTX debacle and, and, uh, uh, and you think about the SEC agenda, which I want to talk a little bit about this year. Before we get terribly specific, how, you know, what's most, as a compliance professional, you know, what do you right now worry about the most? Like, what's most troubling to you, Fizza, uh, that you're seeing in the marketplace as you kind of head into 2023? It's interesting because when we were prepping for this podcast, I recognized that there can be so many nuances about the answer I'm going to give. Right. And it unfortunately is nothing new. It is something where every single time we onboard a manager, every single time we help a manager go through a regulatory exam, the biggest takeaway that we have is about appropriate documentation. Everyone that comes across our path, we know in essence, they're doing the right thing. They're trying to do the right thing. Right. And that's why they engage us, because we have the expertise to guide them and show them what the right thing is. They want to do it. Maybe they just don't know how, or they don't know what the right thing is. Right. So we guide them to that. The biggest issue is then documenting it. The regulators cannot just go inside your brain and take your word for it that you're doing everything you say you're doing. If it's not documented, if there isn't any evidence of it, then it's not, it hasn't been done. Yeah. So you see that regardless, uh, you see that kind of issue across kind of across the board, right? I do. I think the other part of that is ensuring that all business units within a particular manager, whether it's portfolio management, middle office, back office, that they're all talking to each other. Right. They actually are on the same page. 
And that may, to your audience, that may sound a bit ridiculous if you're a smaller manager, if you're in, and you maybe only have five, 10, maybe even 15 people. But even in firms of that size, it's, it's really astonishing how much they work in silos because, and through no fault of their own, that's what they are thinking about. That is their vision on a day-to-day basis. This is what I need to focus on. This is what I need to do. And what I would encourage managers to think about is understanding what all business lines are doing. What, and it doesn't have to be in hyper detail. It just needs to be understood as to how it impacts them and in their role and what they do, and then the overall firm. And honestly, I think a chief compliance officer or a CCO can be instrumental in developing that level of communication and and understanding. You know, it's an interesting point because um, you know, we kind of call it a, a culture of compliance, right? And, yes. And, and um, so one of the many things we do is we look at the quality of some of the filings, right? That yeah. uh, an advisor kind of sends to the SEC. So whether it be a Form ADV or a Form D or 13 FG and D, uh, you can tell from that filing whether the because everything on those forms comes from those silos that you're talking about, right? That's so you exactly can kind right. of tell if they are or aren't communicating, right, based on on that quality. Um, let's talk about 23, right? And, sure. and I want to get into your 23 agenda. I think it will dovetail into the, a little bit. I'm sure the SEC's 23 agenda, but let's kind of start with with. Um, uh, with silver regulatory, um, yeah. You know, what are the top things for the firm that uh, you, uh, you know, you as a CEO are focused on for, uh, for for this calendar year? For sure. So one of the things that we at Silver have are three distinct business lines, but they're now not surprisingly coming together. The first is the foundational work that we do, which is within the regulatory and compliance space. We, as I mentioned earlier, we advise investment managers, even limited purpose broker dealers of all strategies and asset classes and ensuring that they are in line with not only regulatory expectations, but investor expectations, which leads us into our ESG practice, and that is one of the areas that we will focus on for 2023, and not surprisingly. So when I launched Silver back in 2018, we as a firm recognized the importance of ESG well ahead of even that launch date, because we were very active in Europe, just individually with our clients, et cetera. And I, along with our head of ESG at Silver, the, the, the lights were just popping. They're just like, this is happening over on this side of the pond. What are we not realizing here in the U.S. is that right. it's in, inevitable that the, these standards are going to be put upon in investment managers that are regulated in the U.S. And here we are almost five years later, and ESG is at the top of mind. So we feel that we've been at the forefront of this. This will be a very, very important topic for us to focus on an area because now the SEC is dipping their toe into that body of water. Right. So it's only a matter of time and the SEC is already on it, that it will become a an actual regulated area of investment management. There are several proposals out there right now. Our team wrote a comment letter in response to the ESG naming convention proposal that the SEC put out. So all of these things are just underscoring our concern and our development of the work that we're focusing on to ensure that managers who are either purporting to be ESG focused or have an ESG strategy 
or even want to use ESG factors as a part of their investment decision making, understand that this has regulatory impact and it as well as investor impact. Yeah. Yeah. And then finally, our third business line is specifically related to investor due diligence. So we know that there are plenty of uh, firms out there, such as an Alborn, that help institutional investors conduct due diligence on managers and help to suss out, if you will, the strengths and the weaknesses that these managers have and if they are within a risk tolerance that these institutional investors can bear. What we at Silver do is take the other side and help the managers themselves with developing their DDQ, with responding to due diligence questions to ensure that it's consistent with their regulatory filings, with their marketing materials. And we also help prep them to be in front of the regulator, similar to a mock exam. Yeah. We'll do a mock DDQ interview, which sometimes can be very intimidating when you're in front of a large institutional investor. Yeah, sure. And we have recently launched this service, and we think that it's it has done particularly well, especially for those managers who may not have the resources to dedicate to to uh, these projects, such as the answering of DDQs, developing of the firm DDQs, but it also allows for a third party to give an independent oversight yeah. and, and allow for them to understand what they need to be focused on. Well, you know, that independence is a, is a nice check and balance, right? I mean, it really is. you know, one of the things you and I talked about a month or so ago is you know, we actually risk rate the middle, the infrastructure of an advisor. So the, the right. primarily the middle and the, and the back and office. And we look for high risk business conditions that are inconsistent with the marketplace. And those can be flags, right? Those are big red flags. Well, you know, why does somebody have 69 affiliates when the average advisor has three? Right. right. Or did you know that? 70% of SEC fines have been to firms where the CCO was also the COO or the CFO, right? <laughs> um, you know, there's there's some very interesting things you can do with when you correlate these these uh, um, uh, factors to um, marketplace consistency, right? Um, Absolutely. You know, so let's move a little bit to the SEC agenda, right? I I. I looked sure. at it, uh, and it's uh, it's intimidating. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I there are you know fifty two items on the agenda, and twenty three of them at uh, proposed rulemaking stage, and yes. twenty nine at final rule stage. Right, so there's a lot of activity. Um, there's a couple, you know, I wanted to just get your take Please. on, and in yeah. no order of importance, and, and and obviously any others you want to talk to, but sure. one is the whole. Increased due diligence on third-party service providers, right? Yes. That that um, you know that an, uh, that an investment advisor has to um, uh, you know has to now document to one of your earlier points, right? Your, your take on that one, and just your kind of view and and on it, and then how to how does a silver help somebody on in that in that space? Yeah. So ever since the two thousand eight financial global crisis, I think the SEC has been on a very strategic and and a, the level of scrutiny around this topic has not diminished at all. If anything, it's increased. And the reason being is that at first when we heard that the SEC wants to, back in 2008, wants to actually have managers diligence their service providers, we would get so much pushback, George, so much pushback. And they would say, well, wait a second, if I engage a Lehman, if I engage a Schulte, if I engage like all these top brands um, that are, you know, 
well known and well regarded in their field, why like why should we have to diligence them? They're just known to be good. Yeah. And I said, well, look what happened with Lehman. You know, like, it, and it's it's not to say that the diligence would have prevented you from going with them, but at least you can support to the regulators and to your investors. Right, the selection you made. Why we chose that. Yeah, right. right. And not through any fault of our own, this happened. And it, it just allows you to have a cushion of credibility for why you have these service providers as a part of your arsenal essentially to do the work that you do. So yeah. we always give that perspective and background. I think it's really important now that we fast forward to 2023 and see that it's a part of the actual proposed rulemaking that, listen, even firms like Silver are going to be subject to this scrutiny and to this review. And I say that is good. Yes. For, for a few reasons. First and foremost is what we just spoke about. It, it allows for you to substantiate and present from a regulatory standpoint and from a, an investor standpoint why these service providers are a part of your team, just from a business planning perspective. Then on top of that, you have the opportunity to actually get into a level of detail with these providers, I'll use Silver as an example. So if a manager comes to us and they need to conduct diligence on us pursuant to this rule, then not only will they understand what our strengths and weaknesses are, but they'll also understand if we are compatible as a service provider to this business. And it's not to say, you know, obviously we, we would love to be able to take on any and all managers, but sometimes there's a better fit. Right. And that is something that this type of diligence will be able to uncover and it will help us as a service provider as well. So I think it's really important to note from a practical perspective that even though Silver, as a service provider, will be even under a sharper microscope and lens pursuant to these regulations. I think it's really a good thing. And it yeah. will allow for this. I mean, listen, it protects the investor, right? And, and it totally does. It, and, you know, we, listen, we were, uh, we, we were very way ahead of this. Uh, you know, we've, offered, we've been in the market with something called best fit for a long time. And our definition, you know, it's, and I'm not just limiting to this, but is we look at the types of books that service providers service. Exactly. Right? So, so whether it be size, whether it be strategy, whether it be geography, you know, I, I think the, 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 the difficult part of this for service providers is it, it does, um, it defines your sweet spot. Yeah. But it does make it difficult for you to expand sometimes beyond that sweet spot, right? Because, um, you know, if you're not servicing structured asset funds and you want to, you know, how do you get, how do you get selected, right? For the next one, right? So, so, so exactly. it's going to force people, you know, there's a lot of views out there. It could, it could create some consolidation. Um, uh, it's going to force people to really decide what they're good at, right? They're going to invest in, Right. So it should be very interesting. Um, the, the second one I wanted to ask you, and it ties to something you talked about, was, sure. was just the whole documentation of compliance reviews. Uh, yes. You could chat about that. I think it plays exactly into something you talked about earlier, right, as one of your pillars. But but uh, your views on that, uh, Fizza. So annual reviews pursuant to the Advisors Act doesn't have any specific guidance as to how they need to be conducted or documented, et cetera. And it was, it's in the recent past that managers would not document or have a report showing that they've conducted their review. In fact, oftentimes they shied away from it because they didn't want to have in writing their weaknesses or areas of improvement or enhancement. And this is something that 
throughout my consulting career and even in my career as a general counsel and CCO, I've always told the managers that we need to have something to substantiate that we've done this. And yeah. a receipt from your third party consultant or your outside counsel showing that there's a line item that we did the annual review is not going to cut it. Right. So I think this is actually a good thing. And it's similar to what we were just discussing about the documentation and the diligence around third party service providers. It will allow for the manager to really have a proper understanding of where, what the state of affairs is with not only their compliance program, but various aspects of their firm overall. When I started my career, never in a million years did I think that valuation, fee and expense allocation, um, back office generally by way of finance yeah. would ever come under my purview and needing my level of review. But now it is expected that compliance, that the CCOs be directly involved in each and every one of these types of as, uh, aspects of the, of the business because there is some sort of regulatory implication. And the only way to be able to really have a true handle on that is if you have some documentation and support around what it is that you're reviewing. And a shameless plug here is that this is why independent third party oversight in situations like an annual review is really important because you can be able to represent to the regulators as well as to the investors that, listen, we brought in silver, they did their annual review of us and our program and these are their findings. So yeah. it's an independent assessment. And this is why the SEC likes firms like ours. And there's plenty of work to go around. It's not just right, that right. we monopolize it. It's that with these rules, with these proposed regulations, it will just really enhance the need for this independent oversight. Yeah, agreed. All right, last one, because there's sure. 50, over 50 of them, right? I uh, know. We just want to talk briefly your thoughts on uh, you know the, the 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 rule around fund fee disclosure. Um, yeah, I listen. This is a, I, kind of a tougher one, right? It is. I was about to say because from a regulatory standpoint, I get what where they're coming from. They feel that having this level of disclosure is a part of investor protection. And I respect that. I think practically speaking and from a business standpoint, it's it may convey actually convey the wrong message to the investors because of the type of disclosure that they're required to be putting forth. And it's going to, I think, discourage managers from trying to figure out ways that actually will will benefit both the manager and the investor as it relates to fee structuring. So this is a tough one. And this is one where I, I respectfully disagree with the regulators as it relates to this type of disclosure for private fund managers. Yeah. The whole the whole concept behind private fund managers and the reason why they do not need to register their fund vehicle like a mutual fund manager would is because the investors are sophisticated. They're supposed to be coming in with a, set, a knowledge set that a typical retail investor would not. Would not, correct. That's why you have 3C1 and 3C7 standards. To apply the retail level of thinking in the private fund space, I think is detrimental. From yeah. a regular and I think, you know, there's a school of thought that people are just trying to start to grease the skids for retail private fund investing, right? And, and they and, tried that already. Yeah. I mean, this is not a new concept. This right. was happening in the early 2000s and there was some traction, but it didn't really take off. And I'm not saying that it won't take off now as a product, 
I just think that we need to be very careful as to not integrate retail with sophisticated investors because then then you're kind of blowing the whole concept of mm. that level of freedom for private fund managers to have. Yeah, with I, I mean, I think what's going to, well, my opinion is what I think is going to end up happening is though we'll, we'll get to some level of people agreeing to what are marketplace practices, right? Yeah. And there'll be some level of consistency, right, that people are looking for. So, uh, all right, well, listen, I'm looking at the clock. I think time is about up. I, I want to thank you really for, for a great, great conversation. You were a terrific guest. Thank and, you. Uh, we we loved having you. So uh, thank you. And I wish you, you know, continued success. And uh, we think very highly of your firm and uh, want you to know that, uh, um, uh, you know, we are big fans. So So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. It really has been such a pleasure. Well, that was a great conversation. I'd like to finish with a brief overview of our monthly lead tables. As you know, we do, we take a look at this kind of year over year. So th these views are January 22 to through January of 23. So over the last, the last year. So as you know, a tough year in the markets in terms of assets on, on the uh, fund administrator front, uh, you know, asset growth was down a little over 3%. And what we talk about is the distribution amongst uh, um, uh, the different service providers. Uh, what's interesting is while the market was down 3%, uh, administrators one through five were down almost 6%, but administrators six to 10 were up about seven and a half percent. And administrators 11 to 25 were up over a little over 4%. So. Clearly, a trend we see uh, over the, I'd say, the last year is business moving kind of down market a bit, right? On the audit front, and this specifically talks to the assurance business, um, again, the assets down a little over 3%. Uh, the big four down about 1.6%, so uh, about better than the market, but still down. What's really amazing here is uh, the assets uh, uh, in auditors 5 to 10 were up 19%, and auditors 11 to 25 were up 13%, and auditors uh, over, you know, 26 plus were up about 15%. So, so very significant growth given that down market. Um, on the on the custodian front, um, what we like to uh, I'd like to talk about that same view. So, uh, custody assets went down. Uh, about 4%, uh, or excuse me, we're up about 4%. Uh, uh, custodians 1 through 10 were down a little under 1%, and then custodians 11 through 25 were up about 5%, and custodians 26 plus were up over 20%. So we saw very significant growth in kind of that, that second tier of custodians. And then lastly, I want to finish with prime brokers. Uh, on the prime side, we talk more about fund growth, right? So funds were up about 10% on the prime side. And when you look at primes uh, 1 to 10, they were up about 3.5%. And primes uh, 11 to 25 were up about 6%. And then all of the primes are up well over 10%. So interesting distribution. Uh, and uh, I think we will continue to see uh, consolidation. I think you will continue to see advisors um, kind of diversify uh, their service providers. And I think that's going to be very impacted by what we talked about today, um, you know, uh, as advisors are going to have to really do, you know, you know, more significant due diligence on their vendor selection. So I want to thank you for uh, another session, as we said, session number, uh, episode number 23. We'll, Next month will be our two-year anniversary. I want to thank you and have a great week, and we will see you in February. Uh, this is George Evans, and I appreciate, as always, you listening. Thank you.